most of you have come before and you know that our convention at one place is to take a book of the Bible and work through it for the whole semester. And this semester we have been in the Gospel of Mark. And most of you, a lot of you as students also know, you are giddily aware that this semester is all but done. By the way, teachers are also giddily aware that the semester is almost done. And so is the book of Mark. So we are in chapter 15 today with just one more chapter, chapter 16, that is left. Now last weekend, a good portion of the world celebrated what is called Easter. But we're going to rethink Easter again today in very specific ways. Easter, of course, is the Christian holiday that rejoices in the reality of a risen Savior, Jesus' resurrection. And we celebrate it not only because it's miraculous and it is counter to the laws of nature as we know them, and it completely circumvents an otherwise finite lifespan that humanity is stuck with, but amazingly, and more importantly, we celebrate the resurrection because it has an eternal repercussion for all of us. And in fact, the, the resurrection is essential. It is essential to the fundamental story of Jesus and everything he claimed given all he said about his messiahship and his own divinity and his own statement of his mission to reverse the constraints and curse of sin and reverse the reality of death for all humankind, Jesus' resurrection comes as the obvious litmus test, the proof, if you please, that he could actually accomplish what he claimed he came to do. Otherwise, without the successful resurrection, all of his efforts, his precious encounters, even his theological teachings regarding the character of God, all of it becomes rightfully suspect and judged as ineffectual without the resurrection. Now, Jesus may have gone down in the annals of history as some kind of remarkable person, maybe even a gifted philosopher of morality. But in the end, in the end, without his resurrection, his credibility and his whole mission would have been seen at best as some kind of misguided hype, and at worst, a complete failure, maybe a simple lie. The resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of all he proposed to have power and rule over, and it is the very gift that he came to offer to the rest of us the whole human race, freedom and eternal life. Only through his resurrection does Jesus become infinitely more than a really, really nice guy. In conquering death, Jesus establishes himself as the sovereign ruler over nature itself and also the loving savior of a very difficult and fallen world, and still a really nice guy. Our dearest friend, our eldest brother, as he describes himself. That's the story, that's the full story of the resurrected Jesus. And it is one that every human being shares in, in some way, in one way or another. So that's what we're going to think about a little bit today in the text that we have. I would invite you to pray with me as we look at Mark chapter 15. Let's pray. Dear, gracious, heavenly Father, I thank you 
for the supreme gift of Jesus' life and his death for my sins and my destined sorrow. And I ask that today you help all of us to see ourselves for who we are and simply, willingly accept what Jesus did in what it affords each one of us. To that end, I pray for all of us in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So, every gospel tells the story of Jesus' resurrection in marvelous, witnessed reality. And that's what Christians around the world celebrated last weekend, his resurrection that we call Easter. But here in the chapter that we have for today, we're not quite there yet. Mark is still leading up to the resurrection. And in chapter 15, actually, Jesus is suffering under the angst and horrendous abuse that will lead to his death. At the end of chapter 15, Jesus died and is buried, but there is no resurrection. Not yet. That only comes in the next chapter. So you might imagine, as I did, if we had blundered a bit in how we had ordered our teaching schedule here at one place. Easter has now come and gone, and we're still here in chapter 15. But as I read through the chapter, I began to realize an amazing and sobering opportunity in our seemingly awkward schedule of reading chapter 15 after Easter, in the afterglow of the Easter celebration. So, in the safety of a now resurrected Christ, we have a chance to review the holiday from a different perspective and take an honest look at the human side and see how people and their choices colored and shaped the concluding events in Jesus' life and fundamentally, fundamentally dictated the unfolding of his horrific, gruesome death. I'll tell you at the onset, it's a rough story. It isn't pretty not one that we will ever be proud of. But still, we can look at ourselves and know that Jesus was the victor, and somehow he still loves us against all reason, as he always has. You see, the inescapable truth that we find here in chapter 15 is that it was people human beings that were the driving force in Jesus' crucifixion. People like us, threatened people, facing the risk of losing power and influence. They killed Jesus. Upward mobile people who hung on to human systems, even with all their limitations. They killed Jesus. And so did selfish people who put their own success before that of anyone else. And cowardice people who simply let somebody else do all the talking for them. Short-sighted people who couldn't see beyond the moment, caught up in the fury of current events and somehow lacking a godly perspective or center mindlessly moving through the flow of the loudest voice and the strongest trend. I fear there were a lot of those kind of people directly involved in the death of Jesus. And definitely some people without a faith and way too many people without any sense of moral obligation to another human being. Say nothing of the Son of God. Though Jesus didn't really see a distinction, did he? When he explained that the least of these is like himself. Those are the kinds of people 
that killed Jesus. And of course, there were quite a number of folks there that straight up hated him. They were definitely involved in his death as well. And as hard as it might be for us to swallow this reality, people, more like you and me than not, they were the throngs that hollered and jeered or just stood by doing nothing when Jesus died. But in the safety and reassurance of Christ's glorious resurrection, and perhaps only within that context, we can now bear to take a look at ourselves and see who we are in this story, who we are as human beings, and how we as a collective race of people and as individuals responded to the crisis and interfaced with Jesus in his moment of greatest challenge. That's what chapter 15 provides for our careful, thoughtful consideration the week after Easter. So as the chapter begins, they are in the throes of a trial, a religious trial, conducted by clergy and church officers. Clearly the powers that be, the voting majority of people with influence and sway, want to be rid of Jesus. He has messed with the balance of power and made the accessibility of God far too wide and encompassing. They hardly have a job anymore. He has become countercultural to how things have always been for them and how those in power would like it to stay. And they wrongly presume that they can regain the upper hand by simply putting Jesus to death, how little they understand. In their frenzied efforts to reestablish control and wait for a Messiah who looks and acts more like the one they want, they have forgotten some of their history and much of what their prophetic writers had foretold, except, of course, for some of what Moses wrote, some of his more memorable lines. They remember these. They know they can't just murder Jesus openly. Since God's clear injunction at Mount Sinai, murder has been off the table. Further, even the world outside of Judaism seems to have a clear sense of this. People get it. Generally, murder doesn't sit well with the world. I mean, if we're honest, Committing murder might, once in a great while, seem desirable, if you're mad enough. But the minute it is threatened against you, it all comes into exquisite focus. Nope, murder is definitely wrong. It's not okay to take another life just because you feel like it. So open murder is out of the question. And they have another challenge as well. Under Roman occupation, they no longer have the legal right to condemn anyone to death. They can make rulings on spiritual and even moral missteps and violations, but only the Romans can condemn someone to death. So now they need to carefully work in connection with their enemy to get this done. How awkward for them but they managed to find a way. They accuse Jesus of treason against the Roman Empire, a self-claimed king intending to overthrow the Roman Empire. That's how they present him. But oddly enough, had he made that claim, they would have far more readily embraced him. But his insistence on forgiveness of sin and a heavenly kingdom and way of life was far less interesting and inspiring to them. So they finagle this lie until it sounds like a truth. And then they brought the charges before the court of Rome. 
they will use supposed due process and protocol as a way to channel evil and hatred onto humanless shoulders of legality and procedure, giving themselves enough distance to, to miss any real culpability or guilt. And they are not so different than anybody else. This is the story of Mark 15. It's rough, but it's how it all came together. It is full of hatred, cruelty, selfishness, conniving truths, i.e. lies, false facts, and awful trouble, a demonstration of the all-too-natural bent of humans' ways of thinking and behaving when push comes to shove and our needs and our wishes are threatened. And in the end, they succeed. And Jesus indeed suffers a grisly, humiliating, painful death. So, what I'd like us to do is look at some of the more prominent human figures here in the story and how they contrast with the person of Jesus. And as I read through this chapter over and over again, I began to see a common human weakness at play. It is our funny way of thinking that somehow numbers mitigate blame. They do away with blame, even justifying otherwise poor behavior. That is, if we act badly, but with enough support and participation from others, we somehow feel validated and exempt from any of the penalty. Maybe it's just simple math. If we spread the guilt wide enough, then almost none of it sticks to any one of us individually. This seems to be the mode of operation here in chapter 15. All the major violations and moral misconduct are committed within the context of numbers, groups of people and not individuals. I found this fascinating and quite enlightening. And just as numbers can bring about good for good circumstances, they can also be a powerful purveyor of inexcusable wrong as well. So let's take the Sanhedrin for an example. Verse 1 in chapter 15 says, the whole Sanhedrin, priests, elders, scribes, teachers of the law, Pharisees, Sadducees, a good mix and representation from all the power brokers in church and society, which were one and the same back in the day, the whole Sanhedrin, says Scripture, reached a verdict. They were one in voice. Jesus must die. And now all they need to do is to get Rome, to get Rome to convict him. And by the way, evidently they had also incited fear and some kind of condemnation against Jesus among the parish, their people, the society around them as well. So that a large mob, and I'm kind of just speculating here, of maybe bored, just plain angry, scared, certainly causeless citizens, joined the frantic entourage as they dragged Jesus from their meeting and brought him to the Roman governor's palace. But the governor, Pontius Pilate, like almost every other human player in the story, he too is unwilling to make a singular individual decision. He doesn't really see a problem with Jesus, and he can't seem to match a suitable crime to the penalty that the crowd is demanding, death on a cross, but regardless, he will default to whatever consensus he can manage to negotiate with the loudest voice and the biggest crowd all the same. And he too finds strength in numbers. 
And he also relies on the process and legality as a way to get himself off the hook. He goes along with an idea about something that was a tradition at Passover time, whereby he would release a criminal from prison as some kind of a gesture of community and camaraderie on their special holiday. He sees this as the perfect option to stay in the good graces of his subjects while at the same time getting out from under any personal liability and guilt that he might otherwise feel for condemning an obviously innocent man to death. He hopes it works. But the record shows, of course, it didn't. They choose another guy instead, not Jesus. They choose Barabbas, a convicted murderer, and they demand that Pilate crucify the blameless Jesus. And like so many of the rest of us, Pilate lets sheer volume overtake human conscience. And he takes the route of least resistance and greatest numbers. The crowd is screaming, crucify him. So he does. And then what about those soldiers? I find them a very uh, fascinating and strange group of people here. Why are they so aggressive and cruel in the story? They have no dog in this fight. Jesus has never mistreated or provoked them. In fact, we could be rather confident that his behavior, Jesus' behavior toward the soldiers, was quite to the contrary. After all, it was Jesus who told the people that if someone asked them to walk one mile, they should walk two. And biblical scholarship definitely ties this to the Roman soldiers. It was the custom back in the day for Roman soldiers to just pull anybody off the street and say, carry my heavy pack as I walk around and do my stuff. And Jesus says to the people, if they ask you to walk one mile, walk with them too. He's their friend. He's supportive of them. And yet they mock him and inflict shocking levels of pain and abuse against him. They spit on him and beat him to an inch of his life. I might be wrong. I have been in the past. Was it one time? I don't care. Okay. <laughs> but I fully believe that had Jesus been put under the charge of a single guard, just one guy with his spear and a little authority, this whole scene would have been completely different. Why is it that we feel the need to flex our muscle and strut our stuff just because somebody else is struggling and we know we can get away with it? And why are we even more willing to do it if others join us? The text here in Mark actually says that these soldiers called in reinforcements as though they needed it. They didn't. They called the whole company, Mark tells us, and then the lot of them gave up every bit of self-respect and decency and treated Jesus like some dirty dog in shameful contempt. What is it with us and our mob mentality? How is it that we so easily lose ourselves and our scruples in a crowd setting? Glenn Stesson, a renowned ethicist and theologian, once told my son, sitting in a class with a bunch of other people, people say things in the plural they would never say in the singular. Somehow we're different creatures in a crowd. We do stuff with a crowd we would be horrified to do as individuals. And it happened at the foot of the cross, too. People just passing by somehow felt emboldened to taunt and mock Jesus. He's sitting there. He's dead on the cross. And they think, now, now's the time to throw my slurs and comments at him in front of an observing crowd. 
chief priests, teachers did the same. Astonishingly, it is the pervasive human contact that we find here in chapter 15. Angry, gutless, foolish groups of people behaving very, very badly. Now, in all fairness to Mark and his account, there are a few exceptions. There is Simon of Cyrene. Now, he doesn't exactly volunteer to carry Jesus' cross. And clearly, he understood that to say, oh, no, thank you, may have had some negative connotations. But at least there's no record of protest. And in the end, his, he stands as a privileged minority who stood in for Jesus rather than otherwise. And there's this nameless man who, upon hearing Jesus cry out to God, grabbed a sponge and filled it with wine vinegar and offered it to him. But Mark goes on to tell us that after that, he told the people around him to be quiet so he could hear whether Elijah showed up or not. It kind of sounds like giving a bunch of kids a few bucks to go buy ice cream. Not because you love them so much, but rather to get them out of the house and have a few minutes of peace and quiet. I'm being judgy here. But of course, at least the man was curious. Now Mark does speak of the centurion, an official in the Roman army, who after observing this whole ordeal of Jesus' struggle and subsequent death, was compelled to proclaim loud enough for people around him to hear, surely this was the Son of God. And this man, this Roman centurion, is a standout in the story. Now, there were people there that were hurting and bewildered. There was a small group of women, Mark says, standing far off, and we can understand why. And there was Joseph of Arimathea. He was described as a faithful man waiting in anticipation for the kingdom of God. And he does, after the death of Christ, boldly go to Pilate and ask for the body of Christ in order to give him a profit, proper burial. There are a few who, according to Mark, stood out from the angry masses. But it is not an atmosphere that any one of us would ever dream or imagine or want at our deathbed. And then there's Jesus. There's no record of an adoring crowd of support for him. The, me, the best he may have had was a small group of dumbstruck people, scared spitless and hiding in the shadows for the most part in order to not be included in the mayhem. We are told that his closest associates, his disciples, openly abandoned him at his trial. They kept their distance, the record tells us. He has no representation not even a court-appointed lawyer. In stark contrast to the masses, Jesus stands alone, completely and fully alone. He has openly admitted that not even God is felt present with him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is noted to have said. But he still stands. Ellen White tells us that the angels looked on in horror, unbelieving of what was taking place and waiting for the word, enough! But it never came. Jesus stood alone in Jerusalem by himself with a commitment he had made so long before that any reasonable person would have told him, don't bother. Clearly, it isn't anything anybody here really wants. And the agreement was made so long ago when you thought it might be a good idea. And Jesus still stands, abandoned and alone. Jesus stood until he could stand no longer. And with a loud cry, Mark tells us, he breathed his last. Humanity looks pathetic.
pathetic in this story. Us. We do. And Jesus, much too kind to seem to know any better. But he did. He knew better. That's why he stood. So that he could stand forever. And so could we. And he stands today. His story, his claim, his mission, his love, it stands today. Stronger and never more relevant and needed than today. And it comes with a pleading, open invitation to take a stand ourselves. And in light of his glorious, secured resurrection, we have that chance and all the confidence we need to stand with him. Chapter 15 is a story about people who don't look so good and an amazing Savior who couldn't look any better.